There are several footprints in the mud, left by work boots. Anywhere from six to twelve pairs have walked here. Maybe more than twelve. No, eight pairs of boots have shuffled back and forth in the mud. One, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 46. Two, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. Three, hobnailed work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 43. Four, standard work boot, number 45 or 46. Wait, which is it? You don't know. It's a miracle you can tell the prints apart as it is. The cold must have preserved them. Five, another standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. Six, an aberration, light as air, even pace, same make of boot, but number 41. Male or female? Impossible to tell. Could also have been an adolescent. The gait is undeveloped. I'm pretty good at this, ain't I? You're not bad. It's as if the whole world darkens. Everything else has a thin film of unimportance on it, and the tracks burn in the middle of it in a strange, beautiful way. Seven, the glowing outline of a standard work boot, number 46, but the imprints are twice as deep as the others. The weight exceeds 200 kilograms. Eight, and yet another standard work boot, number 44. There's an aberration in the pattern of the sole, however. The right sole is smoother, more worn. How many? Eight. I was pretty off then. I counted 20. The same guys are going back and forth. I never got the hang of it. Hyperopia. Do you see anything out of the ordinary? Right step, number 41 shoe. A woman? Or a kid? Could be a woman. Okay. How do you know? He knows it's hard to discern sex from a person's gait. I'm just saying random things while looking at holes in the mud. I have no idea where any of this is coming from. That's okay. Go on. A heavy one. 200 kilogram imprint. 200? Could it be the combined weight of two people, one carrying the other who's tied up? Let's say a heavily built worker carrying a similarly built, soon to be dead man. He might be right. 200 kilograms of living weight is unlikely. Maybe it was a giant. Maybe it wasn't. There is real, palpable excitement in his voice at the prospect of it not being a giant. But maybe it was. Just imagine it. A giant man at each two and a half meters tall. It could have been, but if it wasn't... It could have been an extremely obese person. I can't see any prints fitting the armor boots the victim was wearing, can you? Someone had to carry him. Are any of the other prints deep enough? Yes. Which ones? That's a tree. I think we are close to a conclusion here. One of them was carrying him over. Possibly, yes. But why? You're thinking, why did they have to carry him? Yes, they could have used the makeshift stretcher or just march him up to the gallows. Maybe there was a physically impressive strongman in their midst. Someone who wanted to impress their peers. Maybe the carrier wants to impress their peers with a display of physical might? You mean a display of athletic ability meant to belittle the victim? A local champion carrying the intruder alone? I can see it. Anyway, the others? An aberration. One soul is smoother than the other. Interesting. Let's name it the old soul. You could almost feel the association taking form in your frontal lobe. A driver would wear down their right shoe before the left. The accelerator is on the right. So maybe one of them wasn't a dock worker, but a driver. That traffic jam in front of the harbor gates. 
I wonder if it's lasted as long as the strike. Check out the big brains on whatever your name is. The joy dissipates down your spinal column like a grounding effect. Glorious intellect at work. I just blew this shit right open. Wide open. The expression is blew the shit wide open. Beneath the mirthless exterior, the lieutenant is amused. Although he does not actually think you blew it wide open. We should keep our eyes open around the traffic jam. See whether anyone strikes out as a potential suspect. Seems prudent, no? Yes, prudent. Mm -hmm. How old do you think these strikes are? A week, maybe? Seven days would fit the time frame provided to us by the caller, who reported the hanging. It is not impossible. How do you know? As I said, I pulled last week's forecast for coastal Havashal. Seven days below freezing. The day before his hanging was the last warm day. Correct again. Sub-zero temperatures would preserve the tracks in a good state. The commotion here could have taken place a week ago. What do you think happened here? What do I think? A mob of people brought something heavy to the tree. One of them was carrying the victim. They shuffled around, especially under the tree. Then, after hoisting him up, they stood in a semicircle facing his direction. At first glance, this appears to be a lynching. Indeed. They all stood in a row here and looked at the tree. Yes, everything fits so well. Carried him over, hoisted him up, watched him hang. This is easy. Isn't it strange to have your assumptions confirmed like this? This is what someone whispering suggestions in your ear would like you to feel. I think we have a firm understanding of what happened here. The lieutenant's eyes narrow. He's thinking to himself. In doubt, perhaps, it would be unprofessional of him to be sure of himself at such an early stage of the investigation. Either way, what else? We've been draw of it. This trash container is locked. The sliding lid has a padlock that says, whirling in rags. There's something in there, not necessarily connected to the case, but still. Why am I looking at you, trash container? You're just a trash container. Just a trash container? There is no such thing. Your fingers start to itch just looking at that padlock. Lieutenant, what do you think could be in there? Trash, food waste from the cafeteria. They lock these containers to keep the derelicts from flocking in. Could be evidence too. Yes, I feel like there's something in there. What do you mean, feel? It's extrasensory perception. Whatever is in there holds a special significance. I agree. We should get someone from the remote viewers division here. He's being sarcastic. Do not ask what the remote viewers division is. What is the remote viewers division? All the detectives from all the prisons who experience extrasensory perception go to the remote viewers division. Their work is invaluable to the force. It's remarkable how he can keep a straight face. Take note, the lieutenant is well versed in dead panning. Many of the things he says could be meant in jest. Wow, could we get them here? No, because they don't exist. I'm so disappointed right now. I thought there was a remote viewers division. There isn't, but we should still access this container. How do we get the lock open? We could try using a pry bar. There's one in my motor carriage, or... Did someone say pry bar? Fuck yeah, pry bar. Pry bar, pry bar. Your palms yearn its cold touch to grasp it once more. As you've done so many times. Or, Lieutenant? Or we could ask for a key from the manager of the Whirling in Rags. He probably has one. He might also have information. This is better than the pry bar idea. Ask the manager? Bullshit. Go straight for the pry bar and pry this baby wide open. 
Before you stands a motor carriage. The bodywork is covered in blue and white livery, bearing the number 57. This must be the infernal machine that tore you from oblivion. The Cupris Kinema motor carriage. In the cabin, you are welcomed by a set of steering levers, a radio microphone on a hook, a pull-out toolbox under the seat, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. A scent of leatherwork and heavy fuel oils washes over you. The white suede feels luxurious under the touch, and the metal clutch handle so very familiar in your palm. Your fingers waste no time closing around the handle. Clutch disengaged. Release the handle. Clutch drops. Right foot yearns for the familiar touch of the accelerator pedal. You have synced with the machine's mechanical circulation. Do I know how to operate this machine? You feel an uninterrupted connection to the mechanics. Wait, does it mean I know how to pilot it? After a while, you realize silence is your only answer. Do what you will with it. Of course it's only in your head. Of course it is. But it almost feels as if the clutch handle is gently squeezing back. How are you, my friend? The smell of freshly treated leather. The lack of dirt and dust on the dashboard. And a neat little brush in the cup holder. All seem to be whispering. I'm good, cherished and cared for, in the hands of a tending owner. Where have you been? At the bottom of the sea. What? So strange. The machine is not on the bottom of the sea at all. It's right in front of you, well kept. Why did it leave a dark feeling? This is going wrong. Let go of the clutch. The handle is pulled back. Somewhere deep inside the drivetrain, the disc is mated to the flywheel again. In the cabin, you see a set of steering levers, a radio on a hook, a pull-out toolbox, and the soft glow of the fuel preheater gauge. A metallic drawer slides out from under the seat and clicks into place. The tools inside are neatly organized. Take what you need, officer. It's going to be a long case. I'm not protective of my tools, like some men are. He's clearly a little protective of his tools. But what can you do? Work is work. The pry bar feels nice and cold in your hand, heavier than you'd think. Cold and heavy, like truth. You feel like you're reunited with truth once more. Useful for opening all sorts of doors and lids. The handles are long and sleek. Snap, snap, go the cutters in your hand. You can do good work with these. Cut chains, locks, and ropes, especially belts. It's robust, weatherproof, and well-made. Police issue, blue. Lets you see things in the dark you would otherwise miss. The pull-out toolbox slides back into its nest. Preheater gauge casts a warm glow on the steering levers and the radio on its hook. As you tap on the gauge, the indicator pin jerks as if startled. It's in the large orange sector, indicating the engine is warm. Next to the gauge is a red switch labeled heat. There's no use pressing the heat button. It won't start without the ignition key. Translation. We're not going anywhere right now. Alternative translation. Don't even think you can drive my MC. This trash container is locked. The sliding lid has a padlock that says, whirling in rags. You stick the pry bar into the fissure beneath the lid and push down. It doesn't take much force. With a satisfying crack the metal gives way you can open the lid now don't maybe you shouldn't didn't i just have a premonition that there's something in there there is but you won't like it sweat forms on your brow your hand is still on the lid the smell of rotten food rises to greet you you see soggy cartons, dirty rags, and organic waste. 
We're just in time. This hasn't been emptied for over a week. You see, milk and egg rest with one broken egg in it. Some pasta wrapper. Picking up the soggy packages somehow feels familiar. You've done this before. The movements are recorded in your elbows. The methodology in your fingers. You're used to this. Used to what? Dumpster diving? No. Searching for evidence in the trash. A box falls into pieces in your hands. A tea sole cereal. There are plastic pasta packages below. And turbo noodles. Nothing of note, however. Among the threadbare kitchen towels, something catches your eye. A pair of denim trousers. As the legs of the slime-covered jeans begin to unspool from the garbage, a rank corpse smell fills the air. Are these the victim's clothes? The smell is not nearly as bad as the cadaver. These clothes could not have been in contact with the deceased for more than two days after his death. Cadaverino door is faint. If these belonged to the deceased, they were removed when he was still in the early stages of decay. Drop them in here, officer. By early stages, you mean these were taken from him no more than two days after his death? Yes. If we're still assuming the clothes were taken off to get to the armor, they must have stripped him of it fast, the scavengers. In a matter of days. Guitar marked blue jeans. Pockets. Empty. Or emptied. He wore them with a belt, too. A white belt. The loops appear stretched, but... The belt is missing. That's it. Do you see anything else in there? I have another bag here. Something slimy catches your eye. A drab, long-sleeved shirt, olive-colored, appears from the food waste, dripping with pus. This is a military-type overgarment. No label or serial number. This is the kind of ribbed shirt that's worn over light armor to conceal it in an urban scenario. Anything more? The rest of the rags are just kitchen variety waste. A yellow old mug that catches your eye. But other than that... A thrown up towel, a mug, that's all. All right, we should go to Gart again and ask if he knows who put the clothes in the trash. It could be as simple as someone from the hostel cleaning the yard. Or that one. I'd advise against confronting that force. Yeah, we need to ask the kids who put them here. The fuck's he on about, kids? You hear that, Kuno? He thinks you're an infant or something. See? You think someone from the Whirling might have been involved, maybe? Not really. All we know is the victim's clothes are in the trash, the lid was locked, and his establishment had the key. It's just a small loose thread. Okay. The lieutenant nods, then looks back into the trash container. It's just organic waste, cold and slimy on your hands. Apple and potato pills, mostly unidentified sludge, and the occasional chicken bone thrown in for good measure. But hey, nothing. It's nothing. Nothing more to see here. What's this? What? A blue piece of plastic sticks out from the apple peels. It's shiny. Looks like the corner of something. They look badly damaged, but you can still make out forms and notes, written in a man's handwriting. Not just any man's. This dense cursive, it's yours. Officer, is that your paperwork? No, it can be. Yes, it is. Look. This plastic has the RCM street grid on it. You've even got an autopsy form. If you don't mind me asking, how did this get in the trash? It must have been cramping my style. Officer, this is an official piece of paperwork. It probably contains notes on numerous ongoing investigations and could even list undercover operatives, informants. I suggest integrating it into your style for all our sakes. Easier said than done. How could this pathetic cabbage of copy paper and plastic ever become Tre Disco?
Challenge accepted. You should be on the lookout for stylistic elements that elevate this cabbage to heights unforeseeable. I don't know. It seems foreboding to me somehow. Like there's something in there that's out to get me. What are you talking about? No one's out to get you. Get real, man. Upgrade that cop ledger. Alright then. Seems like a good idea. Right after the garbage, of course. Good choice. Soggy carton and some kind of food sludge welcome you back. Inviting me. Officer, this is sensitive information. You need to take this seriously. I don't know, man. Sounds like an order. I don't take those. I see. Yes. You are what we call a badass, aren't you? Wow. Went off script there. Getting your ass handed to you. You shouldn't go picking fights if your rhetorical faculties haven't suggested it. Tell me, does your badass see more in there, or are we done here? Ah, yes, and it would also be appropriate to start taking notes on the case. It's what cops do. The mug. I'm getting that mug too. You pick out a broken mug with an oddly racist depiction of the yellow man frolicking in saffron. An antique? Only in its social sensibility. Mm -hmm. The container sounds a muffled gong. That's one thing off the list. I think we got it all. A racist mug. What's there to read here? Not much. There's a quad. Quite a lot to read into here, actually. Look at all that content. Oh boy, here we go. What are you going to say about a broken, tossed away mug that you dug out of the garbage? The mug would be useful. By denouncing it, I can earn political capital to match my badass hustling. Fraud and embezzlement. If you want to earn some change by guilting people, go for it. But if you want to earn real dough, finish the case and start getting paid again. It's the ledger you found in the trash. A pitiful cabbage of white and yellow papers hanging from plastic board, barely held together by a metal clip. This sad display is made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. Anything else? There's a piece of toilet paper, or is it cleaning tissue? No, it's toilet paper, desperately sticking to the back of the blue plastic clipboard. It's a metaphor for you. Thank you, waterlogged ledger, for spelling it out for us. Below the pathetics, terror. Do not look into its blue heart. It's just toilet paper sticking to the back of the plastic clipboard. You can take it off if you want. Maybe it's kitchen tissue? They look exactly the same. If you want it to be kitchen tissue, it can be kitchen tissue. It's not though, it's toilet paper. Still wet, the toilet paper, I mean kitchen tissue, sorry, peels off the plastic easily. All you have to do is shake it off your finger and voila, the ledger now looks marginally better. An aluminium block runs the width of the board, biting down on the paperwork. Its crocodile teeth are the only thing keeping the papers together. A regular pencil, the tip worn down to nothing, has been attached to the clip. The surface is interrupted by a silvery sticker. It's rectangular, sparkling with iridescence. You don't know how you didn't notice it before. Looks like an official mark. Made to be low visibility outside the right circumstances. It is similar to the RCM watermark on your blazer the lieutenant mentioned. Didn't he say something about the headlights of his motor carriage? That you can read these there? Lieutenant, is this one of the hologram watermarks you mentioned? What? Yes, uh, allergen watermark used for adding information to RCM property. Interesting. What kind of information? It depends. Aside from an anti-counterfeiting stamp, mine has my station number and address. 
The information varies by date of issue. Maybe yours will have how many cases you've solved. How many years you've been on the force, he's thinking. It'll have that. Your kill count. Yours will surely have your kill count. How can I read it? Any capable light with the right wavelength will do. You mentioned the headlights of your kinema? Yes, RCM vehicles have headlights tuned especially to reveal halogen watermarks. This means you can read the watermarks if you just turn the lights on. That's all, thank you. Okay. While a bunch of sodden papers sag from the clipboard in your hand, it's a sorry sight. They're not exactly white. They're yellowed in patches by sunlight and alcohol and covered in dense blue handwriting. Ink escapes into watercolor patterns, reaching its tendrils across entire pages. The paper itself is checkered with faint red lines forming short paragraphs. Once in a while, there's a red stamp that exclaims, case files commit to paper. The case files themselves are plenty. You count more than a hundred sodden, crumpled up, earmarked pages falling apart in your hands. They appear to be sufficiently organized and extremely dense, if mostly illegible. What is in there? What are they about? Work, strife, poverty, the Jamrock Quarter. These are handwritten logs of investigations dating back to January 51, this year. The exact number is hard to estimate, due to missing pages and an odd naming convention. But there are at least 20, maybe 30 cases, undertaken, not completed, mind you. It's the middle of March. You have attempted two cases a week on average. What do you mean? Is that all? That's it? The notebook is annual. It says 51 on what remains of its cover. A molten strap of cardboard. Everything prior to this must have belonged to a previous volume. In short, there was more. Judging by the creases on your forehead and the lines on your cheeks, too much more. Going back years, decades even. Is two cases a week a good case, Lieutenant? Huh? Two complex cases to undertake is a lot, yes. You really have to push yourself. I would not suggest it, lest you start making mistakes. Two cases a week appears to have been my role, Lieutenant. I'm not sure I completed them, though. Two? That's a lot. I didn't mean to say you are making mistakes, by the way. That was presumptuous of me. A nice brisk pace. The way I like it. I prefer normal caseload. It's a matter of method. Not you. You are an eternal machine. Like a fan of girls, the checkered papers dry in your hand. The handwriting is extremely dense, if mostly illegible. It's inornate, nearly illegible, yet marching in orderly lines. Pedagogical, somehow. Brash. It must be yours for you to be able to read it. These are the lines of someone who has written by hand a lot and has developed a style only they themselves, or you yourself, can decipher. Written in a rush, in pain, a race to beat your own heart's pulse to some dark finish line. Your hand cramps up merely looking at the scribbles drawn as by some magnet to the red checkered margins, fast but always straight. Who is this person? Weary now. Nearly gone. Sometimes he forgets to keep the pen on the paper as he moves his hand, and the lines vanish from underneath. There was a mention of a gaming convention here? Yes. It appears you employ a, shall we say, robust yet literary system. Each investigation has its case number written on the margins. Yet, still more tellingly, most are accompanied by a name a title one might say even one that draws inspiration from snoop fiction and vespertine cop show staples oh my and they're written in capital letters too yes all caps one is called the next world mural another the square bullet hole murders another yet the unsolvable case more others appear more light-hearted the guy's on a couch in an unexpected location, and 
the murder at the hookah parlor. Even the rare article free collapsing tenement. Murder features prominently throughout. You like this grimy murdering, don't you? Wish there was one in there about a drug then. You love those. Gets the blood pumping. No, you don't. You're a human measuring instrument. Almost entirely intellectual. It's going to take an effort to piece these case files together, but it can be done. Once you're done inspecting them up close. Kim, my cases appear to employ some kind of naming convention. You mean the alphanumeric? Officer, precinct, time of arrival at the scene? No, I mean a non-numeric one with titles. Oh, you mean the titular? Yes, well, so do I. In our defense, almost everyone in the RCM does. Why is that? It's a holdover from the early days of the RCM, right after the revolution, when the organization had little idea how to do things. It persists in an unofficial capacity. Officers use these titles to refer to their work among themselves. I seem to have named the case the Square Bullet Hole Murders. Again, in your defense, I seem to have named one the man with the hole in his head. That was a real person. His death was real. Still, I named it that, to amuse myself. I pray his loved ones never find out. What happened to him? Rail spiked through the head. He died. It was a workplace accident. I have to open an official case. Is there room? There is, for precisely one more. Fifteen pages near the end remain untouched by the damage. The checkered grid forms a structure of passages, breaking the case into subtasks to accomplish. Once all the tasks are accomplished, the case is complete. Sadly, the ledger only comes with an old worn down lead pencil. It's unfitting of this monumental event. The ledger only comes with an old worn down lead pencil. It will do, barely. But... Kim, do you have a pen? The lieutenant looks at his blue notebook. Two fat, shiny pens hang from the binder, like large caliber bullets on an ammo belt. It's downright incriminating. He has little choice but to give you one, although he really does not want to. He is not really saying anything, just standing there, looking at them. You know you have to... You know you have to give one to me, right? This is how human society works, I believe. Wordless, he pulls one from the loop and hands it to you. The pen is cold, blue, and ready to write. With this beauty, commit to paper! The tasks you've completed flow out of the blue oblong pen in a brash freehand uncannily similar to the rest of the letters. The wording comes easily. It's almost robotically simple. A language developed for mental rigor and simplicity. Inspect the victim's body. Get the body down. Interview the cafeteria manager. It's not exactly poetry, but poetry would be out of place. A satisfying slash sounds across the paper. You're done, it seems to say. And you, and you. And a fuck you to you too. That last one cuts a slash right through the paper. You're a swashbuckler with that pen, Harry. And it feels good. Feels like completion. Things to be done and things already done. The composition of reality. This is an extremely useful tool for a detective of the citizen's militia. Now all that remains is to name the case. Lieutenant, have you by any chance named our case? No, actually. Any ideas? Shit on a stick. Ha, huh. yes. I have to tell you, officer, I don't appreciate ironic titles. Other officers will have to use this as reference. If it's idiot or cockfinger, they're not going to get it. They're going to think an idiot and a cockfinger were on this case. So, do you have something less funny? Fun is outlawed with this guy. What a knock. The furies are at home in the mirror. Furies? Yes, well, I don't know. 
I have to be honest, I'm not experiencing the internal strife that it refers to. And also, could you make it less poetic somehow? Just a normal case name, you know? Think, what would that be? A good normal name. Yes, yes. You know what that normal name is. But it's so plain. Anything else, please. The setting sun. Okay, okay. It's a good name, but it has one problem. This case has nothing to do with the setting sun. At all. It has nothing to do with that, so... Something more concrete, perhaps? Do you have something concrete? Mundane, usual. Usual is boring. We don't do that. The hanged man. Great, that's great. That's actually what I was thinking too. The hanged man. Good, strong name. We have a very good name for the case now. I'm going to start calling it the hanged man. It's good we sorted this out. I'm done expecting these. You don't exactly close them. So much as distance yourself from the smelly papers. They're a little further from your nose now. Arson, petty theft, spousal abuse, handwritten logs on dozens of investigations date back to January 51. Stamped case files, commit to paper. You don't exactly close them, so much as this. Yes, you can piece them together using the alphanumeric code on the margin. It always begins with HDB 41, then date of initialization and time of arrival on the scene. Follow by the title. For example, HDB 411201170. The Next World Mural. Wait, HDB 41? Weren't those officer precincts? Why, yes, your precinct number is 41. And HDB? Every last alphanumeric in the files begins with it. And these are your case files. It's safe to say HDB are your initials. Horus Devi Berenger? That is improbable. How long does it take to read the case? It takes about half an hour to piece one together, using the system you've devised. Where do you want to start? This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight on 1202, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking central Jamrock. The building is a sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Couron. Cause of failure, rent too high. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible only in the next world. For new people, it is too late for us. Wreak havoc on the middle class. People call it that thing and that fucking thing. It's visible for miles. In two days, the station's complaints desk gets clogged with requests to remove the bummer. You and your partner are assigned to the case. The graffito crew is easy to track down. Only the bell lectures have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the graffito artists is rumored to be rich. They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue of the next world mural, as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. Wait, do I ever find out who came up with it? The case files do not show you finding the author of the design. The crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner, JV, is against the removal, citing public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite organized by you and the rest of Row 3. The 9,000 people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villa Lobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rambling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between two options. 
A staggering 78% of voters choose to keep it. Turns out the opposition were a loud minority. And that love truly is possible in the next world for new people. And it is too late for us. All that remains is to wreak havoc on the middle class. In any case, it appears to have been a rare case of civil activity in the quarter. And agreement as well. What do you want to tackle next? A.K.A. Leslie and Burke. A.K.A. The public indecency drunk and the property damage drunk is a cursed case. It has been passed from unsuspecting officer to unsuspecting officer for 10 years. On January 29, the unsolvable case made its way to you. Why you accepted it, it is unclear. Every officer, and indeed most civilians in general, know it's unsolvable. You were so drunk, you didn't remember what it was when you signed on. That, or you were high. Leslie will always take his pants off when he's drunk. Burke will always trash everything. It's just what they do. It is their nature. You cannot change the nature of a man. And you can't lock them away because public indecency and small-scale property damage are not punishable by incarceration. The only way for Leslie to stop displaying his genitals and for Burke to stop attacking things would be for them to stop drinking alcohol, which in their 40s or 50s, it's hard to tell because of their distorted features, is a medical improbability. Couldn't we just keep them off the streets? You would think that, but you're wrong. Where's the fun in exposing your genitals or breaking stuff in your own home? No, Leslie and Burke are on the corner of Main Street and Perdition, because that's where the action is. Can you keep yourself off the streets? Threatening, fines, dragging them to the station, locking them up in the hell holes they live in, locking them up in the station, hypnotherapy, even trying to get the local gang of Zemiaki to take them out. The Zemiaki gave them ethanol, so Burke and Leslie would expose and rampage even harder. You tried it all, and still the complaints wouldn't stop, as they hadn't stopped for ten years. It's plain to see from the files that you, Satellite Officer JV, and Special Consultant TH, had more important cases to attend to. You uncover cross-reference to several ongoing investigations, each brought to a standstill every time you drive down Main Street. Because there they are, on the corner of Perdition. And what is Leslie doing? Public indecency. Good, you're learning. If the files are to be trusted, that's all there is to it. That and Burke breaking things, and the fact that they're both drunk. But then again, so are you. The case becomes considerably less comic one day, when Burke takes a swing at your ledger. He must have it confused with the property he likes to damage. But the joke's on him. You're drunk out of your mind on potent Pilsner. You slam the hardened plastic board in his face. Then you proceed to beat him unconscious with it. In the process, the ledger sustains damage. The compartment within, reserved for permeable documents, is jammed shut. You stop your assault on the now unconscious Burke to open it, but are unable to do so. The officer began to cry, reports Leslie, who, at this point, is tending to Burke. Kill them. They broke it. He came at us, and at us. I think he was trying to kill Burko. While trying to kill Burko, you slowly come around. The permeable's compartment is open. You've smashed it open on poor Burko's kneecaps. The good news is, Burke can't walk anymore. Can't get out of his apartment. An invalid. With Burke to tend to, Leslie cuts back on the indecent exposure. Maybe he flashes his genitals to Burke. Who knows? But both drunks are off the street. The complaints stop. The unsolvable case is solved. Which is also why the officer responsible narrowly escapes a disciplinary hearing. The end. Do you want to read another one? It would be very interesting to read about these, wouldn't it? I mean, there seems to be a square-shaped entry wound in the victim's forehead. She's been sitting there for weeks, on her rocking chair, with a square hole in her skull, staring at the wall, her mouth agape. But? 
That's all you got. From the half hour you spent piecing it together, all you know is the entry wound was square shaped. You never found the bullet. And then another body showed up, also with a square hole in his forehead. Toxicology showed the entry wound was laced with an incredibly potent psychoactive substance called HUV4 nil. No street name. A sequence killer? Who knows? Those pages are missing. What next? Don't worry. One day, one day you may still catch the man with the square gun. Some assholes brought their couch outside and hung out on it. In the middle of the street, on the roof, on the hillside by the motorway. You know, at an unexpected location. They were young and they thought they looked cool on it. They actually look like assholes. They were leaving it out in all these unexpected and whimsical locations. They took it to where they also took photos of themselves on it and smoked cigarettes because they felt it's intellectual. Cigarette butts, coffee cups, stupid couch. You had to clean it all up and you did. So congratulations to you. Case solved. Did I ever catch those guys? No. You didn't have time for that. These notes show that you have what is called a real goddamn job. You don't have time to be chasing down the couch assholes. You have a real job to do. What next? Murder. Tum tum tum. At the hookah parlor. Was a case originally assigned to an officer called Joseph Mills, who is now dead. Of circumstances completely unconnected to murder at the hookah parlor. Wait, how? Beaten to death by a throng of Villa Lobos gang members when him and his partner JM, only initials mentioned, answered a call one night. It's a sad story and it isn't really represented in your case files. Stop stalling and get to the murder at the hookah parlor. Right, on with the murder. Joseph Mills was on this case that he just couldn't solve, was doing it solo. Said it was a real nutcracker, a real brain twister. Was on it for, like, a month. The captain got impatient. Shit or get off the pot, Mills. Mills didn't get off the pot. Not yet. He kept at it for a couple of weeks more. Racking his brains. Running with every theory, as outlandish as they seemed. Still couldn't solve the murder at the Uka parlor. Tough case, he said. Toughest he's ever had. Wait, was Joseph Mills a good cop? No, he was awful. Awful sense of humor, too. The worst jokes you've ever heard. Really rapey. Still, he'd been on it for months now. Said it was the final case. Said it was uncrackable. That murderer vanished into thin air. That goddamn hookah parlor was all he talked about. Go on. Okay. So the case is handed to you because Mills isn't getting anywhere, and you look into it. Here's the setup. A young man is found dead in a hookah parlor. You know, those places where you go and smoke bubblegum flavored vapor all day. Can you get high off of it? No, it's soot and water vapor. It doesn't do anything. Really stupid. Yeah. So anyway, young man in his twenties found with his skull busted open right on the floor of the hookah parlor in the middle of the day no one else is in there only client that day in perfect health too some kind of movie producer no one enters no one exits he's just sucking on his watermelon hookah all morning all noon like he usually does he's a regular no calls nothing just sucking on the hookah until 15:45. Then, bam, he's dead, on the floor with his skull busted open, blood everywhere. What happened? How can it be? Mills has no idea. Invisible assassin. Movie deal gone sour. Girl at the counter did it. Nothing fits. Eerie. Man just dropped dead. So you go to the parlor. You see cushions around the table. Tables low, heavy, really sharp edge. He sucked 
Hooker stood up, passed out, hit his head on the table and died. See? You can't even read the thing without solving it. Yeah, it was that. Turns out Hooker does do something. It turns off your brain's oxygen supply. And you don't notice it until you get up to go to the bathroom. And what was he doing there for six hours? Smoking hookah. Didn't you hear? I don't know. Trying to come up with a movie script, maybe. Anyway, that was Murder at the Hookah Parlor. Joseph Mills wasn't a good detective, and about 30 minutes has passed, piecing it together. Next. I can revisit this. Not much has changed in the meanwhile. A bunch of sodden papers still sags from the clipboard. In the back, you see thin, translucent copy of paper. Some neon yellow, some bright red. All covered in boxes, like marching armies. These look like official forms, waiting to be filled out. Then rip them from the binder and hand them out, according to type of form. What type of forms are there? Three. The topmost are misconduct fines. The middle ones are station calls. And the bottommost are field autopsy forms. Each is easy enough to make sense of. You don't have to be an intellectual giant to do police work. A monetary penalization ranging from 20 to 250 real. Severe cases allow for 1,000 real, but that requires special paperwork. The details of issuing these fines are spread out over the rest of the fields. But they appear pleasantly vague. A tool for manipulation. Give the lowest amount and people will be ingratiated to you. These are quite sinister in turn. They give a date and time for the person to appear at the specified precinct police station. Below the call are the criminal charges you risk by not appearing. All in a print so small it could be considered downright cute. A dozen pages of thin copy paper, bright red in color. You see the parameters of a deceased human form waiting to be filled in. Age, sex, condition of internal organs, color of the irises, predation marks, condition of sexual organs. Enough of these. Yes, all that remains now is to fill those forms and hand them to people. Fines for wrongdoers, interview requests for bad guys, and field autopsies to dead guys. What delicious power hid within this pathetic mess. You feel better. The rest of the stinking cellulose is much worse for wear. Being sandwiched between the board and the rest of the paperwork must have spared the fragile copier paper. It's made of dark blue plastic, hard enough to beat someone to submission with. The edges are rounded, however. The U4 size board feels thick and heavy in your hand. Light shimmers on its wet surface. On the back, you see the embossed letters RCM. What did you say the color was? Blue. The blue heart. Don't look into it. Something rattles inside, ever so lightly. Is there a hidden compartment? And something small inside? Light, made of paper or cardboard, or dried flowers perhaps? Permeables. It's not hidden per se. The compartment is made for permeable materials that would get damaged if something happened to it. The plastic shimmers like lapis lazuli, but it is not see-through. You cannot see to its center. There's something there. A rectangular shape, like a card or a postcard. There's pain in there, if you want some. That much you know. How would I open it? With your hands. You four sized pages hang from the clip screwed to the top of the board. Mm. The two sides of the board appear slightly misaligned, like a drawer that's come off its slides. If you bend the plastic on your knee slowly, the slides snap back into place. It should be possible to just, you know. Without resistance or sound, the two panels move against each other. The compartment is now open. What's inside? Two ticket stubs and a handmade postcard. Two octopuses are smiling. 
reaching their tentacles toward each other in the colored pencil drawings. The tickets permit access to the zoo in Revachon East. The aquarium costs extra. These let you go there, too. Fucking kill yourself, you asshole. The words just crossed your mind somehow. Who were they for? Who do you think? You. Thin wax paper has been glued to a piece of cardboard. Sounds like leaves rustling when you pick it up. You see violet flowers, floral patterns, patches of glue. It smells of chewing gum, apricot flavored, a touch of cinnamon, the end of summer. You think the label says tutti frutti. Familiar handwriting lines the inside of the card, looped round letters in a woman's hand. A young woman in her twenties. There is care, effort, and a smile, you think. Although that is not something you can read from someone's handwriting. Harry, it begins. You're already reading. I wanted to write you a letter so you can read it when you wake up. Maybe it will make you happy. Throw it away, please. But it will make me happy. A merciful wind blows in from the bay of Revachol, dusting the ground at your feet and raising newspapers far away. You feel the card slipping into it. Let go. What was that? Frisson covers your entire body, a feeling of cold, a persistent chill. Your hands shake, holding onto it. Every morning when I step out, you're asleep behind me. It says, I find a little piece of sadness in me. I carry it in my chest down Voyager Road. Every step I take, it grows. By the time I reach the fuel station, it has filled me entirely. I step onto the light rail and look back. Sparks fall from the bow collector. I know it will be like this until late afternoon when I get off the 42 and walk back to you. You, you. Every step I take will get lighter. It almost makes me run. Sometimes I do. I can't believe I met you. I can't believe the happiness I feel with you. You have a vast, vast soul. And I will always, always, always come back to it. Kisses, kisses, kisses. You feel the air sucked out of your lungs and the blood sucked out of your head. Everything around you gets dark. Small white dots appear. Sparks fall like snow from the bow collector. A streetcar distancing. You feel the ledger slip from your hand. No, no, hold on. To what? There's nothing. Detective, is everything all right? 